So uh, welcome everyone to our international workshop on environment, sustainability and education. It's our third season or third meeting uh, in this season and uh, it's part of the Center for uh, Sustainable Futures in Teachers College, uh, Columbia University uh, with my part partner Oren Pizmoni Levy and uh, myself, Daphne Gan, from the Israel Institute of Education for Sust Sustainability from Kibbutzim College of Education, Israel. And we usually ask our participant in the beginning, just write in the chat, where I come from, hello, and then we are very excited to see people all around the world. So we'll be happy if you could say hello in the chat and uh, we will see uh, where, where are you? coming from. So uh, the workshop, uh, we are holding this workshop, uh, the, the third season, uh, we're trying to make a um, discussion about topics that interest the environmental and sustainability education uh, worldwide, uh, both uh, in practice and in research, and we're trying to combine discussion uh, about research and practice. Uh, so our setting is always to have someone to have one someone to talk with us, uh, to have a talk, and then to to go to breakout rooms and to discuss uh, more deeply what we hear and how it connects to the practice. And. Uh, we started to give a certificate of participation, of participation. So if you're interested in one, uh, let us know, let me know or Owen and we will arrange you a, a certificate. Um, if you're interested in the upcoming session, uh, you are more than welcome to uh, approach me or Owen and we'll be very happy to have you in our workshop. So we're going to today's session, which will be uh, about teacher education as climate action, developing a community-based collaborative approach. And I will say several words about Hillary that uh, agreed to talk to us today. Uh, so Dr. Hillary Inwood, she is a teacher educator, educational researcher and artist who leads the sustainability and climate action network at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. She teaches in, in its master of teaching program and coordinates an innovative partnership with the Toronto District School Board focused on teachers, professional learning in environmental and sustainability education. Her research focuses on deepening educators' knowledge and skills in environmental learning, as well as on developing creative approaches to ESE in a range of educational settings. So thank you, Hilary, uh, that you agreed to join us today. And uh, after you have about 20 minutes, and then we will have some questions and answers, and then we will have our breakout rooms Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining in today. I'm really excited to be here, and I really appreciate the invitation from both Oren and Daphna to uh, share a little bit about what we've been working on at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, which is part of the University of Toronto. And just got to give a, a shout out to so many of the uh, Torontonians I've seen in the room today. Welcome. Uh, lots of our OISE uh, members. members. Um, I am going to ask people just to put their mics on, uh, to turn their mics off, please, so we can just keep the background noise to, to a minimum as we go, which is great. Thank you so much. Um, I do encourage you as I go through this presentation to pop questions into the chat. Um, I'm always happy to, to stop and make this a little more interactive than just a, a regular talk. Um, so uh, what you're seeing behind me in my virtual background, as well as uh, on the main slide, is a picture of our living wall. And if, you, if we were at OISE, that's our acronym today, uh, that's what you'd see as you walked into our lobby. And that's a pretty new addition for us, but I like to think signals um, the, uh, the seriousness that we're taking sustainability with in our institution. 
Um, I also thought I'd start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, this is very traditional now in, um, in uh, Canadian settings to recognize the, the lands on which uh, the original peoples of the lands on which we're, we're on. Uh, the University of Toronto is hosted on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. Um, we also recognize uh, the enduring presence of all First Nations Inuit and Métis people uh, across what is now known as Canada. Um, I will say that the photograph you're looking at on this slide is a mural. It's a pretty new mural to campus. Uh, we're getting an increasing number of artworks and um, architectural installations that remind us exactly of the original peoples who were on this land uh, before the university was here. This mural was created by an interdisciplinary artist named K-Rock. Uh, he's a member of Nipissing First Nation here in Ontario, and it symbolizes the seven grandfather teachings of the Anishinaabe. Uh, those teachings are humility, courage, honesty, wisdom, truth, respect, and love. Um, and it features uh, Grandmother uh, Moon and Grandfather Sun, which represent our connection to Turtle Island. That's the word that uh, Anishinaabe people use for North America, um, to the water nation and to Mother Earth. Um, those seven grandfather teachings are a great reminder to us about what's important as we move forward in uh, working in sustainability and climate action. Um, you know, I don't think I could convince anybody in the room that education must be involved in taking climate action. Uh, I'm not going to convince you of the climate crisis. I think we're probably all on the same page uh, that we are in the throes of a crisis. But we really need education to step up and play a much bigger role in the cultural shifts needed towards sustainability. We need um, to be modeling climate action for all ages, starting in preschool and moving right through higher education. We certainly need to deepen our knowledge and our sense of responsibility about working towards greater climate justice. And then finally, we need to help to empower individual and collective hope, a sense of agency and action. Just to give you a little bit of foregrounding about OISE, there's a photograph of our uh, 1969 building that we are still functioning in. It is not particularly um, environmentally um, appropriate and uh, not a very sustainable building, honestly, in, in the long run. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, its original origins uh, goes back to 1906, but most formally was uh, instituted in 1965. Uh, we are the largest graduate education facility at the University of Toronto, maybe across the country, actually. We certainly have the largest pre-service teacher education program. Uh, we have over a thousand students in that program, and we are the largest in Canada, um, and we are well-respected around the world, I think, not bragging, but I think we came in at fifth in the time, Times Higher Ed uh, Faculty of Education list uh, most recently. So you can see that we're, we're a really large institution, uh, over 140 faculty. The roots of sustainability and climate action work do go back uh, uh, pretty nicely uh, to the 1990s. Many of you may have read the work of Graham Pike and David Selby, who initially led this work. It went quiet, though, once they left um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and um, we reinstituted it in 2008. We are thinking about teacher education as a form of climate action on different levels, both in sort of a, a micro level in PTE, pre-service teacher education. And that's really where we got things rolling again in 2008. I'll walk you through that in a sec. Um, but we, we're also thinking about how we can um, take and use teacher education as a starting point to bring about change in our institution. Um, both at OISE and at the University of Toronto as a whole, um, how we can uh, help to connect to our community and support climate action in our community, um, and also how are we taking that national. So I'm going to walk you through in a very quick doc um, these, these four different levels. Certainly in pre-service teacher education, uh, this was, we started conversations in 2008 and we formally established what we called the Environmental and Sustainability Education Initiative in 2009. And that did align with new policy that came out of our Ministry of Education that said that all schools um, in public schools in Ontario, starting in kindergarten, going through grade 12, would need to be doing environmental learning of some sort in every subject area which sounds amazing and progressive for 2009, but the ministry has not done a good job in supporting uh, the messaging on this. And many teachers would not even know that this policy uh, is, is in fact in place. So we took it upon ourselves to start to 
introduced the policy to teachers who are being trained for classroom practice in K to 12 settings. And um, we did that in a couple of different ways. It started off very modestly as just extracurricular talks uh, done outside of course time for our pre-service uh, teacher education students. Um, we then started to offer what we called course infusions going into existing courses and with some content, some ways to introduce, uh, introduce ESE, environmental and sustainability education. And we also facilitated internships with community organizations that uh, were quite popular uh, at that time. Um, we started an annual conference in 2011. It's been going ever since um, and it's grown actually since then. Um, and we started doing small sustainability campaigns uh, in the building. Everything from asking students to take the stairs in our 12-story building to reduce use in our elevators, energy conservation piece, but also uh, a wonderful uh, supporting well-being piece as students walk the stairs between classes and get their their blood moving a little bit more. We did small things like composting, vermicomposting in one of our classrooms. We'd had a, a clothing exchange a couple of times. So those were really small pieces that started, but it was amazing how quickly that this grew into a broader institutional piece. Um, this really was helped a lot when OISE stepped up and started to fund some of our programs in small ways. It, initially, it was just giving us money for guest speakers, for example, and for a little bit of student support through graduate assistantships and through work study positions. Um, we slowly started to increase course offerings so that we had um, some standalone courses that were focused on different aspects of environmental and sustainability education. Um, some of those had an Indigenous education lens to them. So we've got a couple of courses now on land-based learning, for example, on decolonized approaches to uh, environmental education. And alongside that, we started to uh, advocate uh, more for uh, increased support for research in the building. And we've got a couple of scholars now who are doing focused work uh, in this area, which is great. Alongside that, our facilities and services department started to look for ways to do small scale uh, upgrades to um, our building and to our physical infrastructure to help support sustainability. Everything from motion sensor lights in many of the hallways to low flow toilets, um, to improving our HVAC system to make it more, more efficient, to having more signage in the building that helps uh, recognize some of the sustainability features. And then most recently, the uh, the living wall behind me, which went in, I have to tell you, in March 2020. It went in, and of course, nobody saw it for the next two years. We've uh, only just recently gone back into teaching in person. So now, now more people are seeing the living wall, but for the first two years of its existence, uh, nobody or very few, very few people saw it. Um, part of one of the installations we did in the building was our community garden. Um, this was a, a really important way for us to signal outside the building um, that uh, that this work is important. We have uh, about 30 different native plant species um, as part of this uh, installation. It's not a large garden, it's actually quite small, but we are located on one of the busiest streets in Toronto. So um, we're, we're really pleased to, um, to, to share not only the beauty of the plants, but we have a website that's dedicated to the garden too. So we're able to support notions of educational gardening that go alongside that. Um, Amy asked a question about syllabi for the courses. Amy, um, I can pop a link in a little bit later to our national network that does have a collection of syllabi. Mine, mine is on it, not all of them, but um, that support environmental education. So I'll give that to you a little bit later in today's presentation. Remind me if I forget. Um, and then Lisa asked a question about how are school leaders um, prepared to support teachers? And Lisa, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So thank you for the segue, uh, but we'll, we'll get there in just a few minutes. In addition to the, uh, the garden, we've also got uh, over a dozen environmental art installations and we put them in our main stairwell. So that Take the Stairs campaign has turned into a walking art gallery for the same purposes, energy conservation by not using the elevators, supporting well-being, but also introducing environmental uh, messaging uh, as well in the stairwell, which has been kind of fun. Uh, people have loved these installations. Uh, it, it really does brighten up what is uh, often a very drab stairwell. Um, and we've been able to involve uh, well over a thousand OISE students in their creations. So those are your community-based artworks uh, that have been created not by a single artist, but by many uh, artists, many students who don't consider themselves to be artists, uh, but but do once the installation goes in. So, so these have been uh, really popular. 
All of these institutional improvements have led to, in 2021, the founding of our Sustainability and Climate Action Plan. This came out of a summit that we had uh, just before lockdown in January 2020. Uh, we had um, uh, well over 100 members of our community uh, come together to talk about what we should be doing uh, in terms of bringing this work right across all aspects of the work that OISE does. We are the first faculty of education in Canada to have our own Sustainability and Climate Action Plan. And I love that uh, many of my colleagues and other faculties of ed uh, like this idea so much that they are now working on their own um, sustainability and climate action plans as well. Now, I would say that the University of Toronto has their own broader plan, but what we wanted to do is model not only for other faculties of ed, but also for other faculties at the University of Toronto, that we should be bringing this work home to the specifics of each faculty that we need to really ensure that uh, we do what, what, what we do best in education is different from what the engineering faculty does, from what the architecture faculty does, and that we need to figure out ways to do this work within our purview uh, and to really amplify our, our influence in the field of education. Um, Amani says in the chat that uh, I'd like to see OISE incorporate grid alternatives, the Green Home Institute, the Solar Decathlon. I'd love to see all of that too, Amani. Um, and please, if you have ideas about it, Amani, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with your name, but if you're an OISE student, please come talk to me and I'd be happy to have a chat about how we might be able to do some of these initiatives uh, together moving forward. Um, since we put the climate action plan in place, we've been busy. We've been hosting national conferences. We made uh, U of T's first climate emergency declaration. Nobody else at the university had done that previously. So even though we are certainly not the first to do this worldwide, um, we're the first at U of T to do it. And I, again, we've been encouraging others to, uh, to follow suit. Um, we've launched student sustainability guides, faculty and staff sustainability guides. We now have a new sustainability fund that people can apply to, uh, both students, faculty and staff can apply to, to initiate sustainability projects. And, and one of the ones that I'm really proud of, and I, I noticed that Sarah Urquhart's in the room because she's helping with this, um, is our community of practice on sustainability teaching. So we're offering a number of events. Uh, our next webinar is coming up, it's on hope in teaching. And I'm may, hoping maybe Sarah can pop, if she's with me, um, can pop the link into the chat for that. That will be an online webinar and anybody is welcome to attend that. So we, we invite all of you to join us for that next event. But this is also involved retreats for faculty at University of Toronto. Um, um, to build a sense of community, to uh, continue the conversation across our faculties, which often tend to be a little too So uh, this has been a great way for us to connect across the, uh, the university together. Uh, really has been worked, worked really well for that. Um, thank you, Sarah. And Sarah, maybe you could pop in the page about the community practice as well into the chat. Uh, Sarah last year worked as our graduate assistant. She's one of our doctoral candidates at OISE and um, has now become our administrator for the community of practice on sustainability teaching. So Sarah has been just a wonderful team member for us uh, at, at OISE. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I will say that along the way, we've been working really hard to build community collaborations and actions um, as, as moving up to that next level of, of influence. Um, that started again, pretty simply, we started doing in-service teacher workshops. For those who aren't familiar with the term, in-service uh, workshops are ones for practicing teachers, teachers who are already in their classroom. So we started doing, and quite separately from our pre-service workshops, we started doing in-service teacher workshops on a variety of topics. Um, we uh, accompanied those as, as there was growing interest in leading summer institutes uh, that lasted for a week at a time, and those were a whole lot of fun done with teachers. And then we've rolled those into summer courses now that uh, teachers get credit for. They're called additional qualification courses that happen, and they're a, a form of ongoing professional learning. So we've now got three different levels that teachers can work towards their specialist um, uh, qualification in environmental and sustainability education. And then we also developed over time a, a pre-service teacher um, education cohort of students that worked within an elementary school that had a focus on social justice and eco-justice education. That lasted for five years uh, and worked really well as a way to connect us with practice in the schools. But I would say that um, that's a photograph on the right-hand side that you're seeing of those, those candidates working with students. Um, but I would say that unfortunately the pandemic shut that one down as we weren't allowed in the school anymore because of the pandemic. 
So um, a, a bit of a challenge, no doubt, the pandemic has been uh, for all of us, but we're, we're continuing to work with our community partners. We've got lots of community partners and we've been cultivating relationships with these groups uh, in Toronto and some of them are national groups um, over uh, the, the time that we've had the Environmental and sustain, uh, Sustainability Ed Initiative in place since 2009. Um, but uh, we continue to offer a whole variety of, of um, workshops, webinars, um, conference presentations uh, with, with these groups. It's been a really wonderful thing to draw on their expertise and to really be able to highlight the work they do with our uh, pre-service teacher candidates, which has been great. I would say that this has now grown between the community partnerships with schools and the community partnerships with NGOs has grown into something much broader now, which has been a, a really wonderful collaboration that we've had in place since 2017. Uh, we work very closely with the Toronto District School Board. Um, the TDSB, that's the acronym for the, the school board, is um, one of the largest in North America. I think it's the third largest in North America. It's a very large school board with over 575 schools in it. Um, they have a very innovative approach to sustainability. They've, they're also working on a systems approach. Uh, and in fact, I think our thinking about systems thinking has come very much and been inspired very much by, uh, by their approach. Um, we have now a formal collaboration in place with them that brings uh, the, the benefits of, of OISE and the benefits of the school board together. And I call this an innovative approach, though I know we're not the only ones doing it, to be fair. We routinely bring together student teachers, our pre-service teacher candidates, with practicing teachers to do professional learning in environmental and sustainability education. By doing that, um, we, we, there are all sorts of benefits we've identified for this collaboration, which has been wonderful. Um, we've been able to scale up the number of events, uh, thanks to support from the school board. Um, and by the way, they, they've got the funding for this in place through a unique um, uh, uh, setup themselves. They've got solar panels now on over 300 school roofs, and there's income generated from that and other sustainability practices that they've got in place. All of that money that they generate goes into what they call their environmental legacy fund. And they've gotten their um, board of trustees to ensure that that money only gets put into new sustainability initiatives. So they've taken professional learning for teachers very seriously, and they are uh, the funder, which is amazing of this partnership uh, with OISE. I do say it's innovative in the scale. I know that lots of other school districts and school boards have very small scale partnerships. Oren and I were talking about what's going on at uh, Teachers College in Columbia with the New York uh, school district um, recently. Um, but this is a year-round project uh, that we do with the school board, and it reaches thousands of both teacher candidates and teachers. So I think the scale alone makes it quite unique, and, and the fact that it is year-round and ongoing. So we're just finishing up, uh, heading into our sixth year of this partnership, and we anticipate another three years to it uh, coming up soon. One unique feature of it is that we have an action research team that brings OISE researchers together with teachers, teacher researchers from the board to uh, help to uh, not only develop teachers' research and leadership skills, but also to share what they're learning about environmental learning in their own classrooms with others. And this has been, again, a, a pretty unique partnership. We haven't been able to find another action research team uh, focused on environmental learning like this. Uh, not that we've been able to find in other places in the world. If you know about it, I'd like to hear about it. So please let, let me know if there's anything else like that in, in the area that you come from. Um, and then um, I will say, uh, just to wrap up, that we, we've been working on national collaborations and actions as well as part of this work. We hosted a provincial roundtable on environmental and sustainability ed in pre-service teacher education in 2013 that brought people together, both faculty of education partners as well as NGOs, uh, community educators together in, uh, at OISE. To, uh, to talk about what we could be doing together. That resulted in what we call the Deeper Guide, which is a guide to um, supporting this work in pre-service teacher education. That turned into a national roundtable on um, environmental and sustainability ed in teacher education more broadly in 2016. And out of that came a new national network. So you're seeing the logo on the upper right for what we call the ESETE environmental and sustainability ed and teacher education network 
link is there for you on the screen. And um, this is now a, a, a fantastic network that we've got going with Faculties of Ed across the country. Um, and uh, Sarah, I don't know if you're able to pop in the link uh, right into the chat so people can tap on that if they're interested in it. Um, because of our influence, uh, we're thrilled to say that this has now resulted in a new accord. An accord for the Association of Canadian Deans of Education is like a a policy statement. And they've just come out in 2022 with a new accord that says now that all faculties of ed should be doing this work in working towards an education for a sustainable future. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, uh, and we're, we're really happy. If you look up the name of that Accord on Education for a Sustainable Future, you'll find it on the internet. Um, and this is a really important policy document in Canada now that really requests uh, it, it can't force, but uh, but it, it really does recommend uh, and emphasizes the importance of doing this work in our faculties of ed. So, so that's my broad overview of how we're working both in very local ways, uh, but also trying to amplify our influence and our leadership uh, across um, provincial and national levels as well in teacher education. I think that if we got all faculties of ed across the world involved in this work, we would see uh, much quicker changes happening in uh, K to 12 education systems towards environmental and sustainability education, towards uh, ESD, education for sustainable development, towards sustainability ed. Um, and I think that's one of our challenges as teacher educators is how can we better embed this work in, in what we do. So um, I've got three questions that we can, can guide some conversation. I've been talking a lot. Thank you for listening. Wait, wait, Hil Hilary, oh. wait, wait, wait. Let's uh, give the audience a chance to ask uh, questions oh, before absolutely. we're sending them. Oh, here are our questions. So, uh, and then we will break out the room. So Steve, go ahead. I saw Steve hand. Okay. Don't know what happened to him. Uh, <clears throat> someone else want to ask, comment, or yes, Virginia. Wow, this is incredible. I am flabbergasted by the work of Boise. Congratulations! It's it brings a lot of hope to me. <laughs> um, so I am a um, I'm very excited about permaculture and the, the system of permaculture. And um, I've been looking at my university and we have nothing. Um, I've actually, uh, I've been looking everywhere and it's very hard to find permaculture in the uh, higher education system. Uh, so you said you have a systems approach and permaculture is just that, is to you know, join all the systems in nature um, uh, to work together. So I would like to know if OISI does any work with permaculture. And that's a great question, Virginia. It's really funny. We were talking about permaculture on a, a recent retreat um, that we took to uh, an urban farm that we have on one of the three campuses at the University of Toronto. And uh, I was talking with Isaac Crosby, who's one of our indigenous um, agricultural leaders. And he said, you know, he said he laughs every time he hears the term permaculture because it's what indigenous people have been doing for farming practices for time immemorial. <laughs> so, um, so we take a lot of inspiration from Indigenous education in terms of the work that we do and land-based learning. Um, it's still very much, uh, 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 the, we're at the beginnings of exploring that in the work that we do at OISE. Um, and we're trying to do all we can to amplify the work of Indigenous scholars um, in that regard. Uh, in, uh, we have many at, at OISE, which is fantastic. Uh, we do um, embody the principles of permaculture uh, in a physical way in the OISE Learning Garden. It's, um, it's a... Uh, all native plant species. Uh, we we work with the uh, the fundamentals of permaculture as part of it, and we amplify the messaging around educational gardening more broadly. But I would say that our garden is so small that to to really use it as a model garden to teach permaculture, it's not the best place to do that. Um, and I, I, instead, I've been using the principles of permaculture metaphorically often in my writing. Um, I, I love those principles. They, they apply to gardens and to farming, absolutely. But they're excellent advice for those of us who are leading this work in education. Um, that the, They align very much 
with um, the the principles of ecosystems thinking in in many ways. So I've been I've been manifesting them with, along with my students in our garden. We've been using that and thinking about its connections to indigenous education, um, and also uh, metaphorically as a way to drive this work as well. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. I hope you explore more. Um, and I just want to open up parentheses on that. Sometimes, um, I don't know if uh, people have heard of the Lewis Plateau in China that was completely renovated. Uh, it was 36 million acres of, of land that was uh, uh, restored uh, to its par paradisiac state. Uh, it was completely bare and uh, it was restored. Um, and uh, they said that they spent two years talking to indigenous people and they could not help. You know, their techniques were old and they were the techniques that were making the, the land there. So sometimes um, we, we want to keep those uh, teachings. And I think the teachings of love nature and have nature as the same level of us as humans is wonderful. Uh, but permaculture you know, brings a lot of new technology to join all the um, aspects of nature, the water, the wind, the sun, the soil, you know, the richness of the soil, the, the, the mix with the uh, different plants. Um, so it's water management also. So sometimes we have to, yes, keep the love and all the the uh, philosophy of indigenous people, but look also to the new technology, you know, how they uh, can actually uh, uh, speed the process of nature and make it more abundant in a sh shorter period of time. That's what we need right now to restore our, our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. I noticed a couple of questions from Amani in the chat. Can I address those, Daphne? Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Um, and Manny asked, or, do you know of any grants that install solar panels on schools as a learning experience? And Manny, that's a great question. Um, and in fact, we, we discussed that um, with our partners at the TDSB. The, the Toronto District School Board is now working in close partnership with the City of Toronto. Uh, and the reason for that is that the City of Toronto has brought together all the biggest landowners in, this, in the city. And interestingly, the school board is one of the biggest landowners in the city. Um, and they've done that to help to um, really scale up uh, um, any kind of work that help, would help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so there are grants in Toronto, for example, uh, that you can get from the city to help with solar panels. But I would say that the, installing solar panels um, is not really within the purview of what students can do in Toronto schools anyway. It, it requires a huge amount of technical expertise. And so they do engage companies who specialize in this. They've done this in really innovative ways. Um, they actually, all of those solar panels that got installed on the 300 plus school roofs um, on TDSB school uh, roofs were, were done in agreement with the company that did it um, so that they would have to fix the any leaky roofs first. Um, and so the, they also got all of these school roofs improved, which they had great problems with previously. So having those kind of partnerships in place um, between uh, corporations and uh, the school board really allows to maximize uh, the, uh, the, the physical work, that the physical improvements that can be done. But I think where educators can help is when you know you've got that panel on the school roof, how can we maximize the learning around that? How can we get our students to know how much energy is being generated? And can we tie that to some of the math classes? How can we... Um, get our, our local community to understand what's being generated up there. Because often the, the panels are up there and nobody really knows in the local community. So how can we use that as a way to instigate more panels going up in other locations in our community? So I think maybe that's the, the question really is around um, how can we maximize these um, physical improvements to our school buildings and our university buildings as a way to really help people understand the changes that are that are going on. Um, University of Toronto has actually got um, uh, the biggest geothermal um, energy exchange going in on the heart of campus, the biggest one in Canada, um, going in on the heart of campus uh, right now as we speak. And we've just started discussions about how we're going to maximize learning around that for U of T students and uh, staff and faculty moving forward as well. Many people don't understand what the construction is about, so we need to do a better job on, on messaging around that for sure.
Um, your second question was about um, a particular book used in the um, the uh, pre-service teacher education curriculum. And I would say, I, I don't know the answer to that. We have, again, over a thousand students and I, I don't even know, I haven't even done an account on the number of courses we offer. So I, I can't speak whether this is a standardized book. It sounds like from the title, it might be one that leans a little bit more towards climate science. Um, and I would say that typically the texts we use have a little bit more of a lean towards education rather than climate science. Um, though I can't say, you know, this might be covered in some of our science teachable courses. I, I just don't know because I don't teach those courses. So hopefully that will answer your question, Imani. Um, we've got another question too about, um, oh, introducing small scale hydroponics. Can you give me the acronym on PFAL? I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with that acronym. Do you mind if I just say that um, instead of writing it? Yeah. Uh, it's plant factory with artificial light. And it was a concept that was invented by Chiba University in Japan by Professor Toyoki Kozai, if I'm saying this correctly, I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Yes, there are a number of schools in the Toronto area. Um, I would say that we do have a growing tower at Oise. It's a hydroponic and it is very small scale. It's one tower that we use as a demonstration tower. And again, we shut it down during the pandemic. We're just going to get it up and running again this winter. Um, but there's uh, quite a few schools that have them in the Toronto area. And there's a number of schools that, um, especially secondary schools, that have both hydroponic and aquaponic systems as well. Uh, Don Mills Collegiate uh, is doing some fantastic work here in the city um, under the leadership of Dan Kananik, um, who is this incredible teacher there who runs our green uh, buildings program. And he's got uh, the most amazing small scale urban farm right on the property of this um, secondary school. So we've been doing a lot of work with Dan, uh, making sure that our students get placed there for their teaching practica. Uh, also making sure that we host events there whenever we can. Uh, we did one just last June uh, on the property as a way to introduce a, a larger number of both teachers and teacher candidates to to that kind of practice. So, so they are happening, yes. Um, and the second question was also about, are we open to international partnerships? We're always open to partnerships with anybody. So just uh, reach out and, and let's have a chat about what we might be able to do together, yeah. Thank you, um, And Emily's just posted up in the, uh, about the Enterprise Nutra Tower. Yeah, and the Nutra Tower, uh, the growing tower we've got, Emily, um, is like a Nutra Tower. It's the same thing. I think it's just got a different brand name on it. We were very inspired by the work of Stephen Ritz. I don't know if you know his work in, uh, I'm, I'm assuming Oren does, because he's not that far away. He works in the Bronx and he's got his own, um, I've forgotten the name, Green. Oh, what's it called, Oren? Do you know his work? No? Okay, I'll have to get the link for it. I don't know. If you look up, if you look up Stephen Ritt's TED Talk, it's a fabulous TED Talk that talks all about his work with kids on small scale growing and hydroponic growing in schools. Um, he does it in the, Bron in the Bronx. So uh, really phenomenal work. And that's, uh, we, we got one of his branded towers, but it's the same, same kind of system. So Emily, I hope, it, I hope it grows well for you. That's fantastic. It's very exciting to have it up and running. Um, Lisa has posted a link for solar panel education. Thank you, Lisa. That's very handy. I, I might just pull that down and uh, and get that going for uh, send that along to my, my school board colleagues, uh, which is wonderful. Um, another question for Manny um, is the UN Convention on Biodiversity included in the PTE curriculum. I would say, Manny, that we don't have a standardized PTE curriculum, that because our program is so big, with any given course, we'll have, like we have a course for our um, our secondary school teacher candidates, ones who are going to teach at high school, um, that, uh, that focuses specifically on sustainability education. So it's a 36-hour half course. But we have um, three different instructors who teach that course. So it really does depend on the instructor about what they bring in. Um, I, I just can't say yes or no to your question because I, it's again, it's not a standardized curriculum. There's um, all of our teacher education programs are graduate level courses. And so the each faculty member has quite a bit of leeway in terms of what they teach. Now that's an advantage for faculty. You get to draw on your areas of expertise. But it is a disadvantage in that we can't standardize things um, across courses. So that's always one of the things we're playing with. I mean, when my students come to me for courses in art education, 
They get a strong dose of environmental and sustainability education as part of my art ed course, which is not what they expect. <laughs> um, but but that's what happens, right? So um, uh, so so there aren't we don't really have a standardized approach uh, to readings or or viewings either uh, across our PTE program. Thanks, Lisa. Green Bronx Machine. Thank you very much. There, I just couldn't pull that out of my memory uh, this morning. Perfect. Um, and then also Virginia's posted one about turning desert into sustainable farmland. I would say Virginia, even though um, you know we know issues around um, soil erosion are happening worldwide, that um, in my part of Ontario, we have so much of, some of the best farmland in the world. So turning desert into sustainable farmland isn't really our issue, but getting children to know where their food comes from, getting young adults to know where their food comes from, is absolutely an important part of that equation. Um, and so it, it's, it's all connected, right? Uh, to notions of permaculture for sure. Great questions, everybody, thank you. So if there are no more questions, uh, I think uh, now you can share your, quest your three questions and then we will uh, get to breakout rooms. We will discuss your question and then we will come back to the uh, to hear about the discussion, about some ideas. So if you could, do you want to share or do you want me to share the questions? No, I can share the questions, no problem. Can everybody see those okay? And I appreciate that not all of you might be teaching in pre-service teacher education programs. Some of you might be on the in-service side, and some of you might just be um, more situated in community education programs. Um, so thinking about what is it that, even if you're not inside a faculty of education, what is it that you would like your faculty of education to be doing? Um, and uh, what actions could it be doing if it's not doing these things already? And, and what steps might you take personally to, to build some of this collaboration with a faculty of education to help to amplify climate action in educational circles? Great. So I uh, posted your questions in the chat so everyone could uh, uh, take it to the breakout rooms with you. And... Uh, uh, Oren, do you want me to do it or? Oh. I just did. You just did it. Good. So we will be there in about 20 minutes and we will come back and uh, share our ideas. Welcome back. The, ma the magic of the breakout rooms. You don't need to wait to everyone that is chatting. It just shut down and everyone is back. Uh, <laughs> like a magic tool. Uh, so uh, we, we will be very happy to hear some ideas, comments, thoughts that you have discussed in the rooms. And we will start from room number one, uh, who wants to share with us your ideas. Maybe we can ask Thomas to, I, I think we were room number one. Thomas, can you, can you take the lead for our, our group? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, I hope I hope I managed to capture uh, most of what we just, we were talking about. Um, um, you have to help me a little bit. Uh, but the this we we shared some of the the work that um, different people were doing. There were some questions though about specific things for teachers. Um, I, 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 we talked a little bit about some of the work that. Uh, I, I shared some work from what we're doing at Rhodes in South Africa. Oh, back. <laughs> you had frozen uh, just for a minute there, Thomas. Oh, okay. So I, I tried to share just a quick link about some of the work of sustainability, sustainability starts with teachers, which is um, uh, a teacher focused um, uh, online initiative, which Rhodes is doing to help teachers uh, learn about sustainability and environmental education. Um, I, I can put the link in, in the chat here again. Um, and um, that's also about building building community and building and networking uh, with a focus upon uh, re reaching across national boundaries. Um, and then I, I made a quick plug for um, uh, some something related to sustainability and technology with Mozilla Foundation. I'll, I'll put a link in the chat. Um, did I miss 
although some other things, Hillary, I'm afraid I might need to ask. We had a really wide ranging conversation. We heard about uh, work being done in um, community radio in Romania. We heard about uh, Adriana's work uh, in her faculty of ed in Latvia. We, I, I, we, we heard about um, some fantastic work with Amani, who is doing work on monarch butterfly networks uh, and biodiversity and habitats. Um, I know I'm probably forgetting somebody, but but uh, and and Noah in K to K to five education as well. So so we really had a really wide ranging conversation that it was fa fascinating. Thank you to my to my group for that. Great, thank you. Uh, group number two. No volunteer for group number two. We talked a lot about where each of us were um, and where we were. Uh, seems none of us were in teacher education. Um, some of us are, most of us are students ourselves um, and also teachers. Um, and we talked about just different ways that we are um, trying to make a local impact on what's on in our, our particular areas. Um, Joelle had a, a super interesting conversation um, Joel, maybe you want to share a quick version of that, Joel. Oh yes, thank you. Um, it's um, the the work I'm um, a doctoral uh, thesis I'm working on, and uh, it talks about the the Ubuntu um, ways of knowing, which uh, um, talks about the interrelatedness and uh, interdependence of all living things. Because in Ubuntu we say I am because we are, and I am because of all that is. That is incorporates the, the whole of the environment, seen and unseen, and living and non-living. Whereas um, the Western dispensations uh, think of um, um, philosophies of uh, people like Deca who um, talk about the singular, I uh, cogito ego sum, I think, therefore I am, and that uh, is, the is the antithesis of um, Ubuntu. And uh, because of that self-centered uh, self thinking, the, the, the economy and everything else is based on uh, individualism, the Darwinian theories of uh, you know, survival of the fittest, which goes against community building. And that's what I'm working on. Thank you. And can I just give a shout out to Joel? I was really pleased to learn from one of Joel's recent webinars. He has just finished his doctoral work at OISE, and we're thrilled that he is now introducing concepts of Inbutu to, uh, to the OISE community. Thank you, Joel. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, room, room number three. Come on, don't be so quiet. I'm happy to talk a little bit and those from my group are happy to jump in if you'd like to support me. But it was just amazing and we had people from different disciplines. So myself as a researcher and we had people in teacher prep, we had people in teacher leadership who works in like the you know, teacher leadership some of the Philippines. Um, so we had quite a diverse perspective, uh, cognitive science as well. But we all landed on a, a kind of similar issue, which I found to be very interesting, is that we were talking about the development of some of these practices in within the spaces that we work around sustainability and teacher prep. And um, many of us are connected to higher education institutions uh, through our own learning. And what we found is that many of the disciplines that are offered at that particular institution that we're part of are very siloed in the way that they work and way they consider climate change. And cross-disciplinary work between departments, between faculty, between students is quite limited, which we were thinking that just limits the entire conversation or our push and motivation towards any sort of actualization of an institutional shift towards considering climate change as a whole. But it was quite interesting to see that this is something that I've contended with, but also the four others who I was in the room with also are facing similar challenges. So I found it to be uh, quite interesting that we're all we're all in this together. 
Great, thank you. Someone want to add to room number three? Oh, Darren made a great job as always. Uh, okay, so room number four. I'll try and be the brave one, although you can't see my face. Um, all right, we also had a quite a multidisciplinary team. We had a team member that works at the aquarium department. Uh, if I do say anything incorrectly, please do um, let me know. And through that, they have different trips where they um, teach learners about uh, marine animals. We have someone who wants to make climate change easier for students to understand, and that's done through um, film production. And I think also the link of that is infinityaidproductions.com, it's in the chat. We also have a science teacher, am I saying that correct, Judy? Yes, I'm at uh, CUNY, I did biology. Yes, um, and then you've got me and I work with Erasmus as well with Kostin, who's from Radio Romania, uh, where they're in a different group. And with Erasmus, we have the lovely opportunity to be funded by the European Union to do projects that range from um, creating community gardens to making films that are like National Geographic and teach kids about climate change, all these things that we're very, very happy to do. But towards the end of our discussion, what was really nice that came out was that we need to be, as educational spaces, we need to be intentional about what we do. So while gardens might look great um, and are pretty, we, we could also use them a bit more strategically to, for example, bring food to communities to, to target things like food safety and bring people from different backgrounds together, you know, towards a, working towards a common goal, uh, which is again, food production and to help subsidize, of course, uh, meals that not everyone can afford healthy and nutritious meals. So yeah, that would be team four. Great, great, thank you. So uh, I wonder if you have a uh, more question to Hillary or uh, some thoughts that you you want to share with us or, or to ask, because I have a question, but uh, I, <laughs> I will let you, yes, Colette, you raise your hand or I, yeah. I did, I just wanted to ask Hillary, you mentioned in your slideshow, um, you have a staff guide and a student guide. Would you be willing to share what those look like? Yeah, and in fact, if I can do a shameless plug for, for contact information, let me just share my screen again. Um, so there's the link to the SCAN website. Um, and so the SCAN website has all of our resources on it. Um, so please feel free to dig in. If you pop that in, let me just see if I can get into the chat. Hold on. Uh, Sarah's left the room. Otherwise, I'd ask Sarah to do it. She's been, Sarah's really, really helpful that way. <laughs> uh, I got too many windows open right now. Just one sec. Um, what I'm happy to do is I'll pop this into the, the chat for you. Um, the link to the website. This is the same website. There it goes. Okay, um, and if you go to the website and go under resources, you'll find, um, let's see it, will you find under resources? No, you won't, you'll have to get it into, uh, if you go into get involved and you go into either the student section or the staff section or the faculty section, they each have their own guides linked there. And by the way, we're happy that if anybody wants to take any of these ideas today and implement their own, their own faculty of ed, we're happy for you to do that. We're, we're not being very proprietary about any of this work. We really just want to help get the word out and get the work out as, as well. And if that inspires others, that's fantastic. Um, I don't know if any, I don't, I, we were popping things into the chat in our group and I'm just not sure if everybody can see those or not at this point in time. So um, I'm just gonna grab a couple of those links and re, uh, put them into the chat again for you. One one question had been around the syllabi. Um, let me see if I can get that. Oh, it won't let me copy it, but I'll just pop it in again here. Um, so for ESE syllabi, I'm just going to pop that link back in uh, the, into the chat for you. Oh, no, sorry, grab the wrong one. Sorry, just one sec. That's not the right one. Sorry, I'm just battling different windows here. 
Um, it's part of our, the syllabi is actually part of our national network resources. Oh, okay, hold on. Why is that not coming up? Something weird is happening with my system right now. It's not, oh, there we go, okay. Let's try that one again. The syllabi link is here. There we go. Oh, and thank you. You shouldn't have just popped up the student guide for us too, if you're interested in the students. So there's the, that's the, um, the syllabi page, if that interests. And the other one that I will say might interest some of you is that we did write um, what we call the deeper guide. And the deeper guide is a resource guide for teacher educators and even for community educators who might want to engage with a faculty of education. Um, and so I'm just going to pop that link for you into the, the chat as well. Yeah, okay. There you go. So the deeper guide is there too. So if any of those help, um, I hope they do in some way. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. <laughs> it absolutely did. Thank you. I got caught in putting links into the chat there as we went went through. Hilary, can you can you close the share, please? Yes, share absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I, I have a question. Um, I wonder, uh, because I'm uh, from a teacher's college in Israel, and I'm uh, trying to, my, my program, a master program uh, of environmental education, and they are coming to study this. But I find it very difficult to implement the uh, talking about climate change in in kindergarten in the young ages it's very very complicated so they can do uh, a nice uh, community garden and uh, other activities but they, they they assume and i'm not sure this is the case that if we will do diverse uh, uh, sustainability education activities, they will learn later about climate change. We don't need to talk about it now. It's too frightening. It's too... And I wonder if you deal with uh, you or someone else with kindergarten students in, in a direct way about climate change and not just around the topic. Yeah, that's a wonderful question, Daphna. Um, and we've just been, we were talking about this at our action research team meeting actually just last week um, about uh, uh, age appropriate ways of doing the work. And, you know, for some people, they will say exactly what you've just said that we shouldn't be introducing them to the true realities of climate change now because we know that eco anxiety is growing amongst our students. And we don't want to scare them so much that they think that doing the work is hopeless. Um, you know, we, we struggle with that as adults and we don't want to inflict that on, on children uh, at young ages. Um, but one of the things that we've been thinking about, and it goes back, you can hear I have a passion for educational gardening. We've been thinking about this notion of educational gardening as a form of climate action. It does help. Um, you know, students understand where their food comes from, if, if done well. Um, it can help connect them to, to all my relations, which is a term from Indigenous education, um, thinking about our connections as humans to all aspects of life on the planet. Um, and uh, we can relate things like uh, vermicomposting or, or composting generally as a way to reduce waste. So in many ways, I think there some of the work we've already been doing with young learners is age appropriate climate action. But we haven't always been contextualizing it within the horrors of what really is going on. And for me, I think that's okay. I very much, you know, take inspiration from David Sobel's work, which is, and he's, he said very clearly, we need to help students learn to love the earth before we ask them to save it. So um, I, I personally subscribe to that. I think that there are ways we can do this work in age appropriate ways that gets them connected to the earth, gets them connected to all forms of life on the planet um, with deep um, respect and, and notions of care and empathy um, I, and, and a growing sense of agency as they get older that we might be working on just a some growing things in our classroom in kindergarten, and that might go to a school garden by the time they get to grade three or grade five, and that might go to working on a community garden as they get older, and then into their wider communities and working on 
climate action projects more broadly um, as they get into their secondary years. So I think there are ways that we can scale up, um, but we have to be smart about how we think about those early years and how we're going to develop those true sense of that, that true sense of connection and love for our communities. Um, if we can get them connected, I think that the feelings of wanting to care for their communities and their community members, I think that goes hand in hand as they get a little bit older. Um, and I think that's our job now as educators, is how do we figure out those age appropriate ways to do this work that doesn't just simply, you know, more deeply embed eco anxiety in our students, but develops that sense of agency. So I wish I had a guide to to send to you. I don't, but maybe somebody else in, in the audience today does that they can share uh, with that. Um, but yeah. You might I share some of my thoughts. Mm. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, yeah. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm over here in Los Angeles. So I think I was one of the group earlier uh, to talk about how to teach younger age group because my product, I created a company called Infinity A, mainly focusing on the young age uh, climate education, uh, basically from age from five and up. So what I'm doing, basically, I generate all the university science research article, so and then dump it down and then filter out and then become a younger friendly comics. And then it's more a friendly approach because like you guys say, you know, climate change is a very heavy topic. And then kids, you don't want to frighten the kids. You don't want to scare them and say, oh, your future is nothing. Right. So you want to encourage them to do something good for the future and then protect the planet and then grow a better life. So, I mean, that's what I'm doing here with my company and create all the uh, children friendly contents, comic, puppy show, and a video uh, content and teaching kids about like what exactly is going on in the world. So, how can we make it better? So, in what way they can make it better? So, uh, that's what I've been doing. So, uh, you guys can feel free to check out. My website and I latest just released a Halloween video. It's called uh, it's called Moon Life. It's basically telling kids about you know pumpkin. Don't waste the pumpkin after Halloween because we waste so many pumpkins every year. So and then pumpkin is part of the food you know part of the food change. So you waste so much pumpkin and then you actually create more methods and then become like it. It's like eight percent of the global warming is part of the methane issue. So, and then I, that's why in the video, I, I mentioned it to the kids, it's like, this is very important. You know, after you finish the Halloween, we use the pumpkin, you know, trying to encourage your parents, you know, ask them, help them coordinate with you and how you can incorporate with the uh, pumpkin and then do something good, you know? So, I mean, that's my goal here. So, and obviously, I need more guidance from you guys because you guys are experts here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, two more minutes. Uh, Hilary, do you want to sum up to say something before we're saying goodbye? I'll just say thank you again for the opportunity to introduce what we're doing at OISE uh, to a broader audience. And if anybody would like to reach out and continue the conversation, I'd be happy to do that. Um, just reach out uh, on my email address. You can find me at OISE at Hillary Inwood at OISE. Um, and, and always happy to, to learn more about what's going on in other parts of the world as well. Thank you to you, Daphne. Thank you. And thank you, Oren. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who participated today. And uh, hopefully see you next time. We are going to meet uh, Arin Valls. Yes, Owen. Uh, he will talk to us. So you are more than welcome to join. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Have a good day.